Well, everyone, welcome out to Grace again. Uh, excited for this weekend. Yeah, um, we have been in this series called Things We Forget to Believe now for the past couple weeks. And I encourage you, if you haven't uh, followed along or maybe missed a few of those, to go check out the whole conversation because um, it's been really fun to track through. So the first week, uh, we were talking about um, the storms of life. Uh, really, this moment, actually, when Jesus and his disciples, um, who were fishermen, <laughs> were on this boat in, in the lake and experienced a storm so uh, terrifying to them that uh, fishermen were afraid. And so how Jesus really uh, displayed his power and trust kind of in that moment and that circumstance, Jesus is kind of revealing more of who he is and like what his power looks like and how we trust him and kind of like the everyday stuff of life. And so that first week, we talked about the, the storms of life. And then the second week, uh, at, once they actually get across to the lake, uh, we talked about how Jesus deals with these inner demons. Uh, we actually encounter in, in the story um, a, a man who is demon-possessed. And so uh, really there, there's kind of this whole spectrum, a whole reality of like there is this internal, spiritual, mental, emotional battle that's going on in us that is real. And um, uh, how Jesus uh, heals and intervenes and restores in that moment, it, it again reveals uh, that he's not just in the circumstances, but he's also uh, like kind of to our inner being, to our very core, he is protective, he is rescuing, he is trustworthy. And so this weekend, we're gonna finish out this conversation and uh, hopefully fill it out even more. It's, it's uh, really neat here in, in uh, Mark 4 and 5 where we're gonna be. Um, it's all kind of happening at the same time. It's all happening as they travel across the lake. They're all kind of back-to-back stories and they really help give you a full picture of, of Jesus' goodness and his power and how he affects our lives. And so... Um, As we jump into today's uh, conversation, I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you were desperate? Not just inconvenienced, not just uncomfortable, not just you wish something in your life was a little bit more dialed in, not just that a little something was missing. You were desperate. There's very few times in our life where we experience that kind of desperation. When we uh, first moved here to Akron in 2015, um, we were pregnant with our our first son, Silas, and uh, you know, it was great. So we moved here, it was super chaotic and a lot of new things, a lot of transition, but uh, Silas was a really easy baby. Um, I don't, we didn't like to tell people that at the time because, you know, not every baby, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> luck of the draw. And he slept well, he ate well, he was cute. Not every baby's cute. And, uh, you know, I don't even think I was biased in that. Other people told us Silas was cute. And we have had kids that aren't cute. Um, and so... Uh, <laughs> Silas uh, was really easy the first year of his life, um, probably because the Lord knew (laughs) that we needed that. But he's about to turn a year old. And uh, I remember there was a day I was working from home and I I was working in in our bedroom on my computer and uh, Sarah had gone into Silas's nursery. He was napping or something. I just remember her saying, hey, babe, I need you to come here. And uh, he had been a little sick. He had had a fever. And um, when I went into the room, he was just really lethargic and like he was kind of zoned out. Not just that he was asleep, like he, he was really sick. And I picked him up and he, he was just limp in my hands. And so I remember, you know, walking from the nursery to our bedroom because it was dark in there and I was trying to get a good look at him. And as I sat him down on the bed, I began to see his, his face turning blue. And so I told Sarah, I said, you need to call 911 right now. And so she, she hopped on her phone and she was uh, calling for an ambulance, and I, I remember I was trying to figure out what's going on. Why, why isn't he breathing? Is he choking? You know, what, what's going on right now? And he just started getting darker and darker and darker, and I felt completely helpless. Like, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't know CPR. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what to do. And, uh, you know, thankfully, um, after about, like, probably a minute, which felt like eternity, Um, he actually threw up and he began breathing again. And and right about that time, we heard the ambulance coming and we let him into our house. And, um, you know, thankful that he was okay at that that moment. But I remember Sarah and him got in the ambulance and I hopped in the car and I was driving to the hospital praying some of the most desperate prayers I've ever prayed in my life. Relieved that like he was breathing for the moment, but like I just went through like one of the most traumatic experiences where I had no idea what was going to happen and still had no idea what had happened. And thankfully, when we got to the ER, um, he was fine. 
um, they told us about this thing that sometimes happens to infants called febrile seizures, uh, that whenever their fever spikes really high, they're not fully developed yet, and sometimes they have this seizure. And they said, it's no big deal, um, <laughs> no long-term effects. And I was like, this is a big deal. They're like, you don't need to come back unless he you know, holds his breath for a few minutes. I'm like, a few minutes? Like, <laughs> I'm coming back if this ever happens again. And thankfully, it never happened again, and, um, and he's, he's fine, and um, we've never had to go through that again. But, I mean, you can imagine, right, those desperate moments, especially as a parent, where um, when it doesn't get better, and, and it goes on and on, and it gets worse and worse. Like, there's almost no amount of money you would spend, no amount of distance you would travel. There's really no pride you have, nothing you wouldn't do to find relief and to find help for your kid or, or, or for whoever you love. Like, your desperation in that moment is real, and it, and it has no boundaries. And, and that's, that kind of desperation is what we're gonna be diving into here in this last encounter with Jesus today. We're gonna be in Mark 5, uh, chapters, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And so I encourage you to open up the app if you're able to download that or if you got the Bible on your phone. Uh, if you don't have a physical copy of the Bible, and we would love to give you one before you leave today, just stop out by the info desk. Uh, but open up here to Mark 5. We're gonna get this third and final encounter with Jesus. There's actually... Two stories in one. You get a bonus story this weekend. Um, and we're going to fill out the rest of this portrait of, of Jesus and what he's showing us about himself. But I want you to keep in mind that idea of desperation because it, it is the thread that goes throughout uh, both of these, in, these stories, this entire encounter with Jesus. And so let's uh, read it together. It says, Jesus got into the boat again and he went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. And then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And pleading fervently with him, he said, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him. And all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with a constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she uh, had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I would be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. And Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. And so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, look at this crowd that's pressing around you. How can you ask, like, who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, she came and fell to her knees in front of him and told Jesus what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and he wouldn't let anyone go with him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. And so he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. And so the, the crowd laughed at him, they ridiculed him. But he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. And holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kuam, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. And they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. This is a fascinating 
set of stories, I mean, they're pretty dramatic. <laughs> There's like no way to read it and just kind of gloss over it unless you're in a hurry. Um, but I, I found it interesting that there's two stories here. And the fact that they're so woven together that you can't understand them apart from each other. Like there's no uh, reason you would open your Bible and go read the story of Jairus without realizing like this woman stops Jesus from getting to his daughter. Like it's a part of his story. And, and, and you, you can't understand what happens even to this woman apart from the fact that there's this crowd and Jesus is kind of like on a mission. He's doing this thing and she tries to kind of like sneak in there. These stories, there's, there's so much here that shows they are connected, they're meant to be understood together, and they help us draw out probably the biggest thing we're going to understand in these encounters with Jesus about himself. And so there, there's some similarities. So there's, there's a 12-year-old daughter, right? Well, th- this woman had a bleeding disorder for 12 years. She'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And uh, it's no instance to that, you know, it's Jairus' daughter. And when Jesus finally, you know, is able to acknowledge this woman, he looks at her and says, daughter. Like, that's a unique way to address her. That, that wouldn't be the normal way he would address a woman. of the, He would literally probably say woman, but instead he calls her daughter. There's other ways that it connects too. Um, e- even ways that it's different. So for instance, it says multiple times like, Jairus was the synagogue leader. That meant he was affluent, he was well-known. We even like know his name. His name's Jairus. And when he shows up at the, at the crowd, people know who he is. They like move out of the way because Jairus has showed up. He's influential in the community. But what's interesting is like we never learn the woman's name. Like sh- she probably is a social outcast. Like death and disease is like a, a, a tremendous thing in the ancient world. And so like you have an unknown illness for 12 years, like you're basically a leper. Like n- no one wants to have anything to do with you. So like we don't know her name. She's a social outcast. You're contrasting that with like the synagogue leader, the most, one of the most influential people in the community. And it's just so, so fascinating, right? Like he, he wants everyone to know about the woman's healing, but he almost doesn't let anyone know about the daughter. The, these stories compare and contrast for a reason. And we're gonna look at both of them today and try to draw out some of the things that are meant to challenge us. Some of the things that they're meant to reveal about Jesus to us. Because the one thing that's true about both of these situations is they are desperate. They're desperate. They're at a a point in life that is unlike any other where they're at their last resort, they're at the end of themselves, and they've come to Jesus for help. And so the first thing I want us to look at in this, uh, take out of this section here, is that desperation is a gift to experience God more deeply. It's a gift. And so Jairus comes, he's pleading with Jesus He's like, will you please come to my home? Will you please help? Will you please lay hands on her? Like, I, I need her to be healed. And, and he's come to Jesus because like in all of his influence and in all of his capability, he's all out of resources. He's desperate. And same thing with the woman, right? How long did she spend trying to get well? You know, 12 years. She spent all of her money. The doctors tried to help and she didn't get any better. She only got worse. Like nothing is working for, for these people. And so they're seeking Jesus. And that's why I want you to think about your most desperate moments in life because that's where the, these individuals are at. That's like where I was at with, with Silas when he was having that febrile seizure. That, that's the moment these people are in. Like that moment doesn't feel good. <laughs> It, it, that's why it should feel weird for you that I would say that desperation is a gift because it, it rarely feels that way in the moment, right? Like I'm, I'm not thinking when Silas is, is being in the ambulance, I'm not thinking this is such a gift. It, it's something that feels very counterintuitive and, and may even be offensive at, at first. Like if I, if I was hearing someone say that and I was thinking about my most desperate moment, I'd be like, that is not a gift. That's like the, the worst moment in my life. But I want to um, I want to kind of make a contrast here at, at the onset because what I mean by desperation is kind of how surrendered we are in that moment, how uh, non self reliant we are. 
It's meant to do something in us. And and in fact, God's familiar with it. He knows this is gonna be a common experience to every person in this room. We're gonna be desperate at times. If you um, ever open up your Bible and go to the Psalms, they're right in the middle of your Bible. The Psalms are basically um, a bunch of poems and um, songs and just uh, um, illustrative literature that are like these prayers to God. And um, a lot of them are really exciting. Like you could imagine them probably in, you know, their church services and they're like singing this or reading them out loud. But um, what's really uncomfortable about the Psalms is that uh, some of them are what we call lament Psalms. Like they, they are people in their most desperate moments writing to God, um, talking to him, like maybe even singing or shouting these kinds of things. I wanted to show you what some of these lament psalms sound like because these are moments where people are desperately crying out. They're uh, questioning God's presence in their life. They're calling on God to act and intervene. They're fighting against hopelessness and despair. And so this shows up all over the place, but here are just a few. In Psalm 13, it says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? In Psalm 22, it says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call out to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Or Psalm uh, 42, it says, Day and night, I have only my tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? O God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? I think this is like how the woman felt. I think this is how Jairus felt. They're, They're like in that desperate moment, pretty angry, feeling pretty forgotten, pretty, p- feeling pretty hopeless. Whenever you think about your desperate moment, I bet these are some of the words that you could apply to your life. It's fascinating. This is in the Bible, right? This is how people talk to God. <laughs> this, is, this is a part of their prayer life. This is how they interact with him. And if you've ever felt this way before, uh, you're probably not the favorite person at the party, right? (laughs) No one really likes to hang around someone who's kind of in this place of life. You probably feel alone. Like no one gets you. You feel misunderstood. People can't handle being around you because you're just too much for them. It's interesting. This, This is why we need to understand our desperation differently, why it's a gift to experience God more deeply. See, desperation is a part of a process, Desperation is part of this process where we begin to realize we actually aren't in control of our lives. There is so much outside of our power and control. And things like death and sickness and suffering reveal that more than anything else. Like, it's out of our control. And the process that we begin to enter into is not that we just realize we're out of control, (laughs) we can't control everything, but that God, if he is who he says he is, he is in control, that he is powerful, that he, this doesn't escape him. But many of us today, like, it, it feels backwards, right? We don't want to feel desperate. We don't see it as a gift. We wouldn't, like, purposefully place ourselves there. In fact, we spend most of our lives and most of our energy trying to keep ourselves from being in a place of need, right? We're like, the, the less needy I am, the better. Then I don't, like, need anyone. Then there's, like, nothing wrong in my life. And then everything's the way it, it's supposed to be. But there's something about desperation that brings us back to reality. That if you you feel that way, the way those psalms were written, the the way that lament was, actually, you're in a very good position to begin to experience God in a deeper, more meaningful way. And And that's probably the only thing good that comes from it, is that God wants to meet you in that space. That as you surrender yourself, and as you begin to direct that desperation at him, right? That's, that's what the people in the Psalms are doing. They're not just directing it at the people around them. They're not just writing in their diary. Like they may be feeling all that, but ultimately what they're doing is they're pointing it at God. And, and God's like, hey, let's, let's document this. 
Like, let's make sure the rest of the world knows that I am pleased to interact with you in your messiest, most desperate moments. And and that's good for us because we all find ourselves there at some point in life. It's a part of a process. And it's a gift when we are ready to accept God's will and his way and his time, even if we don't get what we want. It's then that we begin to experience him more intimately and more experientially, experientially, because here's what you'll find is that God deeply cares about you. He's like, I can handle it. No one else may want to be around you. No one else might understand this in your life right now, but I do. I can handle it. Let me sit with you. Direct this to me. And so uh, what's the next thing that I think we need to draw from this? We, we see that desperation is a gift Another thing that I think we have to consider is that Jesus desires for us to have a personal and resilient faith. Both a personal and resilient faith. Uh, Maybe faith is one of those words that just gets like thrown around in church or, or religious culture a lot. What the Bible means by faith is that something is trustworthy. It's worth placing your trust in that uh, something is dependable, it's reliable. That, that's what something means to be trustworthy, to be faithful, to be worth placing your faith in. And to have faith is to actually do that. Like there's a sense of risk in it. I'm banking on this. It's an action. It's, it's not just a thought. It's something you do. You place your faith in something, So faith is not just the vague sense of, I just think everything's gonna work out eventually. If you wait long enough, like good things will come around. That's not faith. It's not in anything. Faith is always in something. And in the Bible, faith is in who God is and what he has done and he will do. Faith is always in who God is and what he has done and what he will do. And so who is God? The Bible says that God is gracious and compassionate He's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and he's forgiving. We see Jesus, right? He is this compassionate friend. He is this mighty savior. He is a powerful God. He he is who he says he is. We we trust who God says he is and who he displays himself to be. And, And what has God done? What is the consistent work that God does in history? He rescues. He brings life. He restores, he intervenes. And what does he get rid of? He he eradicates sin and evil and brokenness and death. Like that is God's mission statement. He's here to rescue us and to push back against evil and to defeat death. And so when you place your faith in Jesus, you're you're placing it in the reality of who he is and, and what he's done and what he promises he will do, what we know he's capable of doing. And so that's what happens here, right? Like Jairus and this woman are having an encounter with who Jesus really is. Like it's crazy. Like think about the woman as they're um, in this crowd and everyone's pushing around and, and Jesus says, someone touched me. And the disciples almost write it off. They're like, you know, there's so many people around you. And he, he's pointing out like, yeah, I get that there's people around me. Like this is a good warning for us here today. You can be around Jesus, but have no experiential, personal faith in him. And so Jesus seeks out this woman and finds her. And he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. He really emphasizes that faith with her. And he wants it to be personal. He's like, me and you. He wants uh, her to understand that she's seen. It's almost like Jesus allows her to sneak in through the crowd thinking that she'll be able to escape just to like point out the moment I've always seen you. Like th- this, is, this is personal. This is me and you. This is interactive. Like you don't just get to sneak out. Like I, I am always with you. Go like you've been made whole <laughs> because your faith, the fact that you, you sought me, this is worth placing your faith in. It's personal. When um, before we moved here to Akron, uh, we were at a church in Michigan. uh, Don't hold that against me. um, (laughs) Upper Peninsula. And um, we were a part of this community group there. And uh, we were deemed to um, (laughs) try to begin to start a community group that would help families with kids. And so um, we just 
kind of always made that our target. We were, we were the only group that really sought out uh, young parents. And me and Sarah weren't even parents yet. <laughs> but for some reason, we found ourselves in this group. And um, I remember there was one summer, um, we went uh, to the YMCA to get free salsa dancing lessons. Yes, imagine that. And I've forgotten everything. I never learned. Um, and we, we went uh, kind of like once a week to the Y. And um, it was mostly just me and Sarah and a lot of older women who wanted to dance with me. And so that was uh, fantastic. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the instructor, like uh, we got to know her each week. And uh, her name was Leilani. And so we invited her to, to come to our church. And uh, she started connecting there. We invited her to be a part of our community group. And uh, she, she had an older kid and a younger son. And um, her, her husband was a little bit, uh, he wasn't as interested in church. He wasn't as interested in our community group. And so we were trying to reach him and, and trying to, to see why God had kind of like brought her into our path. Well, that fall, um, I remember their, their marriage went, uh, it, it took a, turn for the worst, and um, what was really difficult in it is uh, she was pregnant, and so they ended up split, separating, and what was interesting is they were living with her parents, and um, whenever they split, they decided to let him stay with the parents, and they kicked her out. She had no job. She had a, a little boy in elementary. She was pregnant with her, her next kid, and she was desperate. I mean, she was like in this last resort place. And again, here we are as a community group trying to think, man, Lord, why did you bring her into our lives? And definitely feeling like we were here to help meet a need. And it was just so awesome to see our community group pull together. We, we had someone donate a car, like the vehicle they weren't using, and uh, it needed some repairs. So then we had to like pull money together to, to um, put some of the repairs into the vehicle. And we bought her insurance for a year because like she didn't have any money. We just couldn't imagine uh, this, this young mom having to walk in the Michigan winter to the store with her food stamps with an infant and then to walk back with a bunch of groceries. We're like, Lord, you have, you have ordained this moment. You have seen her. You sent us salsa dancing at the YMCA so that we might be here for this moment. And I, like, I felt like God doing that. Our group felt God doing that. And I remember when I, we, me and Sarah were driving the car over we really wanted her to understand that. Not that like we were doing something great. What we wanted her to understand was that like God saw her. He like saw her needs. Like this, this was a personal thing for her. This wasn't just, uh, we really thought about you and wanted to do something nice. Like this, wasn't, this was God divinely orchestrating us to be there in a moment, for her to be here at this time, and for this need to be met by this group of people. And it was God. And I just remember, like, she didn't even want to accept it. And it was like, the title's already signed over to you. Like, here, it's, it's your car. And um, that was what I wanted to experience. I feel like that's what Jesus wanted this woman to experience. It's like, you don't get to get out of here. Like, I need you to understand how I have seen you for all of eternity. Like, your needs matter to me. Even when they feel like they don't, even for those, like, 12 years where you're like wondering if your life's gonna end. He's like, this, this moment, I am, I am here. I am a rescuer. I am compassionate. This is personal. This is interactive. I don't want you to just sneak off. And Jesus takes that moment with her. But it's not just personal faith. It is, it is that. He desires for us to also have a resilient faith. And here's what I mean by resilient Resilient faith is faith that doesn't waver when the diagnosis comes or the verdict of others is given to you. Like when other people begin to determine what the outcome of your life will be. Resilient faith is the opposite of that. So uh, remember when all this is going down with, with the woman, right? The messengers come and, and tell Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Their faith had a limit, right? Well, not anymore. This is the verdict. It's over. And Jesus takes that father. He doesn't even deal with the messengers, right? He just takes that father and he looks him in the eye and he says, don't be afraid. Just have faith in, in me. Like, look at me. <laughs> and Jesus is cultivating a deeper, more resilient faith in Jairus that day. In fact, I believe that's why he begins to say, it's just gonna be a few of my disciples and mom and dad. 
Like this is, this is for your faith. Because he could have drawn a crowd, right? There was already a crowd there. But what would they have come for? To witness a miracle. To witness the healing. Guys, in some ways, the faith is more important than the healing. And that's not to be dismissive of pain and suffering that, that we go through. Jesus is not dismissive of Jairus. But he, he is very targeted in the faith that that family is going to have in him. This is a personal experience for them. And this is the kind of faith that Jesus wants to cultivate in you. Because faith is what leads to healing. The word for healing, it's sozo. It's the same word for salvation. Faith is what leads to your rescue. Faith is what sustains you when you're hopeless and you're desperate. Faith is the thing you need when you don't have the result yet. And that is the thing that Jesus is is dialing in saying, "I, I want you to have this. I want to give that to you, but you have to lock onto me. And in some ways, I think our faith will only be as resilient as we are desperate for Jesus. And so I think these things connect. And let me clarify, like, I am not here promising that Jesus is going to stop every death and heal every sickness. Sickness, I can't make that promise. That's not what I've experienced. Like, Silas is okay, but there are all sorts of moments. I can think of one in particular losing um, Sarah's mom to cancer in 2019 where we, we didn't get a miracle in the moment. Like I'm looking out at our church right now and like I've, I've done some funerals. Like we've done some counseling. We've had those moments where like the miracle didn't happen, whether it was like your kids or your parents or, or your, your closest friends. Like we've done that, right? Th- this, is, this is real-time faith. This isn't just a cheap promise because we know that's not how real life works. And so we, ha- we have to wrestle through that. What do we do with that? What do we do when the physical world around us is breaking down and sickness and death and pain and suffering are still here and we're wondering where God is? This is the last place I wanna take us before we close today. And it's that the gospel offers us a yes and response to pain and suffering. A yes and response to pain and suffering. This is gonna be random and super weird, but bear with me for a second. So I was listening to this podcast and uh, they were talking about how improv works um, and they were talking about the number one rule in improv and it's called the yes and rule and it's that um, whenever you and someone are are trying to practice improv or do a bit, um, you can't tell them no. And so I thought we should do that this weekend and invite someone up on stage, but then I thought that might be awkward and uncomfortable. So I'll just explain it to you. Um, But the yes and rule is uh, basically, so if if one person says, hey, a purple elephant just walked into the room, you're not allowed to say, no, it didn't. That's the stupidest thing ever. You have to like go with it. You have to accept it and be like, yeah, oh my goodness, look at that purple elephant. And there's a monkey riding on top of it. And then that person has to accept it. And that's like what makes improv, improv and fun and entertaining. And um, it's interesting in this podcast, they were connecting it uh, uh, back to the reality of, of who God is and this yes and rule. And what essentially they were encouraging was like, um, we're never asked to deny what's really going on in life. But there's this reality of, of when we accept it and we ac- accept the pain and suffering for what it really is, right? And then we take it to the next level. We take it to the yes and. That becomes something healing. It becomes something faith growing, faith deepening. That's super important for us to understand. So you remember those lament psalms we went to, right? Like how desperate those prayers were. I want you to see how all of them come back around. Like this is the same uh, song, the same poem, the same psalm. We read how they started. How do they end? They end like this. Psalm 13 ends this way. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Settling in on God's unfailing love and his goodness and singing again. In Psalm 22, it ends this way, for he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. 
He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened to their cries for help. The poor will eat and be satisfied, and all who seek the Lord will praise him, and their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. Like they're reminding themselves of these promises and who God really is. His righteous acts will be told to those not even yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. And Psalm 42 ends this way, but each day the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God, the God who gives me life. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my savior and my God. See, they they don't deny their true situation. How long, O Lord? Why have you abandoned me? All I have to eat are my tears every night. They don't dismiss their pain. They don't deny the reality of their suffering. But it's yes and. And they come back around to who God really is. They begin to trust him again. They never have to call evil good. And I I think we really do ourselves a disservice when we look at death and say, oh, God's gonna use this for good. Death is, is wrong. Death is a broken creation. Like Jesus came to defeat death. We don't have to call death good to see that God is good. Death death is broken and damaging and wrong and not a part of God's intended order. It's yes and. This is what the, the gospel allows us to do. And so what's the gospel? Like this weekend, if you don't know what, what the good news of Jesus is, it's that Jesus is who he says he is. He controls storms. He controls demons. He controls sickness. He controls death. He is all powerful. He displays his power in those miraculous moments. He pushes back against sin and death and the devil and all the evil in this world. And he is someone who goes to the cross on our behalf to absorb all that sin and all that death, not just to die but to be raised back to life and say, my power is complete and there is nothing in this world that can get to you and I am worth putting my trust in. And he promises that one day he will return and make all things new. It's not gonna be this way forever. It says he's gonna make a new heaven and a new earth. He's gonna make a new creation. He's gonna give us new resurrected bodies. Death doesn't win. The earth doesn't get to stay in this condition forever. He comes back and he, he finalizes all the work he's begun. This is, this is the gospel. Jesus is who he says that he is and he's able to accomplish what he says he will do because he's already begun the work. And so to have a yes and mentality that's, saturated in the gospel means that anytime you encounter suffering and pain and sickness and death, you get to say, he's not done. He's not done. That's the thing that we forget to believe this weekend is that when pain and suffering and sickness and death are present, we don't look at those things and call them good. We don't dismiss them. When it seems like they're winning, we remember he's not done. Jesus does have the power to overcome sickness and death and pain and suffering and you can be freed to go before him and push your way through the crowd and touch his robe and you can go fall on your knees before him and say, Jesus, I know you have the ability to do this. That's what we did with Sarah's mom. Like that's what I'm doing with with Silas. It is those desperate moments you can come before God in your messiest, most needy and desperate moments and be real and ask of him. Ask him to intervene. But the reality is, is the full extent of God's power and his goodness is not determined by him healing every disease. It's not determined by making sure we never experience death. Because all those people Jesus heals, I haven't met any of them because they're dead. (laughs) We can't make that the measure of his power and goodness. It's not the full extent of it. So we have to come back to the reality that he's not done. It's yes and. We come back to the place of faith, not by belittling what we're going through, not by saying our pain is no big deal, not by saying that death is good, but by 
coming before a God who understands, by coming before a God who is with us in the highs and lows of life, by coming before a God who says he will make all things new. And he's a God who is trustworthy and worth placing our faith in. And so maybe today you're in a desperate place. You're wondering, well, am I gonna get my miracle in the moment? Or maybe you're wondering, I know some of you are wondering, why didn't I get my miracle back then? Why did I have to go through that? Just an honest question I've had to ask myself in those moments is, is the thing that I'm desperate for Jesus or is the thing that I'm desperate for just the miracle? And it's okay to be honest. Sometimes I just, I want the thing that God can give me more than himself because that, that thing feels so real. It hurts so much. I want you to imagine, what if Jesus walked into that home? I just did like this little thought experiment. I was like, what if Jesus walked into that home with the mother and the father and his closest friends and the girl's body? And what if Jesus told them this? Right now I'm gonna ask you to trust me that your daughter is safe and cared for and healed, but in none of the ways you would have expected. And I'm going to ask you to patiently wait to see her again. And I know it seems like it's going to be a lifetime, but eternity is in my hands. And I need you to trust me that there will be joy again. And then he looked them at the eye, in the eyes and he said, just so you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to walk with you through this. You will never be alone in this. I will always be here to listen and to cry with you and to remind you how deeply I care about you and that I alone have the power to make all things new. And that time will come soon. See, some of you need to hear that Jesus this weekend. You know he's powerful, you know he can, but he didn't. And we don't know why. I mean, that's what those Psalms are all about. Why, God? How long, God? But I want you to believe who God is, who he reveals himself to be, that he's not done. That you being desperate isn't, isn't an inconvenience to God. He is pleased to meet you in the messiest, worst moments of your life. And not just to say, hey, figure it out, but to deepen your faith in him, to make it more personal, to make it more resilient. And so the thing I think we all need to think about going into the, the end of our service now is what, what is the and to our yes, right? What's the yes and in our life right now? Because sometimes we don't accept it, right? Sometimes we don't go all the way to, to Jesus with our pain. And sometimes we don't see it all the way through to the end. And we need to come back to who God really is, that he's not far from us, that he's with us in all seasons of life, that he is trustworthy and he is who he says that he is. So I'd like to invite the band out and pray for us. Father, thank you for what's true about you. You're, you're still teaching me that, God, that um, more than me having my life together and uh, showing how capable I am, God, that you are pleased with desperation. You're pleased to meet us in desperation. You hold us when we're hurting. You hear us when we're angry and crying, God. And there are some people this weekend, Lord, who need to accept that. They need to accept that they can run to you, that you will embrace them, that you will understand them. And God, I pray that you would give us the full capacity to sit and lament in our pain and our suffering but Lord, don't, don't leave us there. Even when we don't get the miracle in the moment, Lord, would you heal our hearts? Heal our hearts from the lie of who we, we think you are when we begin to doubt your goodness. Help us to remember that you are good and you're powerful and you'll make all things new. In the ways that you need to do that personally for us this weekend, Lord, I ask that you would do it, that you would show all the ways that you are caring and compassionate and available to us this weekend. Thank you, Lord, that we can call out to you in all times. And we do that even now. And I pray in Jesus' name.